Hi everyone, and welcome to the first episode of Beings of Randomness. A series where you get to see me design random fictional characters and creatures, based on the choices made by applying my own gigantic list into the random choice generator. A little disclaimer though, some of the choices that come up are of creatures and characters from different media and franchises, which will only be referenced and not copied, which are totally different things. Now, with that out of the way, let's get started. Alright, let's generate our first choice in 3, 2... Okay, uh, Lady Amherst Pheasant. This will be our foundation for the creature. You know, the thing that will get us started. You know, the main ingredient. Okay, let's add it there and let's make our second choice. Oh, okay, we're off to a more simpler start. Basically, the power of a list of mimicry powers. Okay, so... Yeah, I might have to look that up because it's basically a list. And I'll determine which one fits the pheasant the most. So let's memorize it like this. There we go. Okay. Alright, now I'm going to get some stuff prepared before I get this started on designing. So I'll see you guys later. Alright, now I've gathered up some reps to get started. I even did a bit of research on the subjects to see what I'm working with, with outside of just the uh, visual elements, which I'll get into as we progress a bit further into the speed paint, which will start right about now. I started the process by trying to form the sketch layout for the pheasant. I usually start by drawing a base sketch to form the silhouette before refining the line art a bit further with another sketch later. I usually use a colored translucent brush before darkening the lines later since drawing with the black lines from the start feels a bit prematurely finalized. I'll admit I got a little bit too excited and just dove right in instead of making some smaller sketches to pin down the characteristics. Luckily in the end, it wasn't too shabby. Also uh, a little heads up. My commentaries are going to be divided up into accessible milestones based on individual segments of the speed paint. I'm not much of a talker as the other content creators. The commentaries will basically summarize each process though and you guys can still see the process so just sit back and watch it and I'll get back to all of y'all when I get the part of coloring this guy in. Once I finished that, I started filling in the color layer, which, like the line art, is not final and only made for pinpointing the color palette. Also, I'd like to share a little tip on designing characters that have the colors of real life references. Do you see how I'm not directly eye dropping every color of the pheasants onto the character? For some of the other colors, like the dark rims of the neck feathers, I just use the same dark gradient of the throat and the face. I use the same method for the marginal converts of the wings, as well as the stripes on the tail feathers. That way, I can sort of maintain the accuracy of the appearance, as well as balance the character's color palette without using too much colors. Quality over quantity as the same goes. Enjoy the process and I'll see you guys again when I start laying out what I got in mind for his power. It was when I was designing the pheasant's second form that I had to change up my methods a bit cause newsflash, this is the same animal with a different form and I wanted said form to still have the aspects of the original form. That was when I had to sketch out some small focal sketches to find the in-between design part by part before applying it to the concept sketch. 
At the same time, I realized I had to do some research on both subjects, the Lady Amor's pheasants and the mimicry powers. From what I read from the Wikipedia, these pheasants are terrestrial omnivores that forage for grains, leaves, and invertebrates, and sleep in the trees at night. They can fly, but they prefer to run at great speeds when under threat. The males also emit a metallic sound during the breeding season. As for deciding which one of the mimicry powers to apply, well, I just added the list from the page, from the power listing wiki into the same generate. And it shows animal mimicry, which in comparison to the general description and the pictures, allows the user to turn one's physical body into one specific kind of animal. So I decided to make a male pheasant that can gain the attributes of a Euteranus, a genus of feathered Tyrannosaur from the early Cretaceous period of China, which is within the geographic range of the Lady Amherst pheasants. It would still have the features recognizable to its original species though, like the plumage and the colorations, while also gaining new attributes like enhanced strength, powerful jaws lined with sharp teeth, and clawed hands in the place of the alula, which is a part of the wing. His ordinary pheasant abilities would also sort of harmonize and bargain with his new saurian power form. Like, while he can't fly as well as his original form, he can still glide for extended periods. Also, due to his new theropod feet, he can't perch in the trees that he used to be able to, but he can still run up vertical surfaces with enough velocity. So yeah, all of that was a last minute decision. Enjoy the process, and I'll see you guys when I start applying the final line art to the pheasant. Shortly before getting to the line art, I watched a video with Lady Amherst pheasants in it to see if I left out any bips or bops that I might not be able to see in, the st in a still photo. And I found out that the birds actually have some yellow at the base of the distinctive tail feathers. As I added that to the designs, I changed their eye colors to match that unveiled marking and bring even more color balance to the design palette. Which brings me to talk about another tip I learned. Videos can be just as useful a reference as images, because that way, you can get a more three-dimensional view of the animal's anatomy, and see regions that are not seen in a single still photo. Although it's still beneficial to also use the two together since their quality and depth may vary from each other. Now, once I got to doing the final solid line art, I started using a nice old classic digital line art hack that I learned during my lifetime, crosshatching. Yep, it saves me the chore of putting effort getting the strokes to look good, and instead just to cross two lines and erase the unwanted ants. Really good for long, thin, almost seamless outlines, as well as some forms of integuments like hair, feathers, and other sharp points your corrector might have. Heck, it even comes in handy during large, smooth curves. Anyways, I'll see you guys sometime for applying the final line art to the Euteranus.
Also, uh, I, I gotta apologize if you guys notice any quick cuts during some parts of the speed paints right now, and or in future parts of the video. There's only so much I can record and preserve with a screen recording app and some limited space on my iPad Pro. Hopefully you guys can overlook that and still enjoy the video. The experience has set my bars a bit higher on recording shorter clips in the future. Sure, it might offer a bit more labor in rearranging them when importing them to Premiere Pro, but I guess that's just a price to pay to get a more complete speed paint. After that, it was smooth sailing from here. Adding solid colors has always been the least harrowing part of making art if you got the colors planned beforehand. I could even say it was the same for when I got the part of laying out the background. At least so I thought. I'll get into that more when I begin that later on.
for the background, I decided to have it be a lineless cartoonish bamboo forest within the mask borders of a smeared paint or ink blotch. For most of the plants, I drew them manually, but for the more complicated details, I had to make do with more of those custom brushes that I made off of recording. That makes with the manually drawn foliage, it doesn't look far too repetitive or not unnatural. I even experimented with planning how the plants would look to the eye, based on how far they are on the ground. Art Studio Pro's perspective grids are okay, but I think that the next time, maybe in another episode, I might just make a custom grid and alter it with the transform tools. Or I would just plan ahead on the appearance of the background, the same time I plan the appearance of the characters. I mean, that's pretty much what a pilot episode is, right? Sometimes to show to the audience as proof of concept to raise awareness of a series while also giving the creator themselves unspoken suggestions and reminders on what to do and plan or improve in the future. With that little bit of insight shared, I'll meet you guys at one of my favorite parts of designing backgrounds, the lighting.
The part that's equal fun and adds some great touches is the part where I add the lighting and shadow effects. You know, beams of light and particle casted from the top of the bamboo leaves onto the forest floor and darker shadows for beneath the ferns. Or I think they're ferns. Uh, feel free to correct me if I got it wrong. It gives me the chance to play around with the layer effects and see what cool things it does. So yeah, that never gets old. You know, next to making custom brushes off screen to help out with the drawings even further. Well, it was fun while it lasted. I'll get back to you guys during the more harrowing part of the speed paint. Corrector implementation. It was the part where I implement the character into the background and make the pheasant not look too pixelated when I shrunk him in comparison to the UT was when things got pretty hectic. I had to cut out a lot of crashes when I was recording and some of the parts had to be shortened because the screen recorder app started cutting off sooner than usual. The parts with the crazy long loading time in particular had to be cut out and replaced, especially during the image resizing process. Eventually, I managed to resolve this to an acceptable degree by expanding the image size more gradually until the pheasant's pixels still look pretty decent even when zoomed in. After that, it was smooth sailing from here. I'll admit though, the experience had me a bit wiser and set the bars a bit higher for how I plan my drawings in the future and set up a few rules for myself. The first most being accessing my reference images from the photo library instead of having them within the picture file itself. When it comes to cell shading, I think the best thing to do is make a one colored base over the original colored layer since it helps to see the character's anatomy more, which would otherwise be obscured by the contrasting colors in the palette. It just makes the process a whole lot easier. Luckily, due to the smaller size, the pheasant wasn't as much work shading as the Uteranus since it has a smaller body area. I also didn't shroud the pheasant with shadows as much as I would when standing next to the Uteranus, you know, since he actually is the Uteranus and isn't actually standing next to it. Originally I was contemplating adding an outer flow effect to the Uteranus, akin to those morphing sequences on the book covers of the Animorphs book series. But I felt that it might clash a bit too much with the implementation to the background. So I just left it that way you know, just imply that it's a form. Well, that's pretty much the whole process. I'll meet you guys at the end of the video.
Once I was done, I decided to name the character Kada, from Terracotta, a reference to the Chinese Terracotta Army statues, and also how it would feel like when trying to take on him during that form. I also imagined his roar would retain the metallic effect of the original mating call, but combined with the loud roars that sound a lot like the Uteranus from Ark Survival Evolved. If you guys want an audible example, here it is. I'd like to thank my family for supporting me on kickstarting this project. I'm started thinking of starting this type of speed paint series after seeing similar works by some content creators, many of which I subscribe to, like Caitlin McCaig and her Monster Mashes, Dina Norland's Random Creature Design series, and Chip Flake when he made those hybrid animal videos. They certainly were my inspirations that promoted me to start the series. And hopefully if you guys stick around, you might see the second episode. And even other forms of content outside of beings of randomness. Until then, I'll see you guys later.